Anderson, who we've seen several times before and always really appreciated. Um, he is an interfaith and non-denominational New Thought minister. He's also a religious science practitioner, and he's studying to be a religious science minister. So I'd like to welcome Raymond. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So how are we all today? Awesome. Wonderful. So for those of you who remember me, you know I like to ask teacher questions. So I would like to start off with asking you a question. I'm going to give you a word, and I want you to give me what that word means to you, right? So we have this word life. We have this word living. What does that mean to you? Give me some things that connect to what does it mean for something to be living? Aware. Aware. Breathing. Breathing. Moving. Moving. Give me two more. Creating. Creating. Reproducing. Reproducing. So the theme for the month, and this is why I'm asking you this, the theme for the month is the living spirit. God is alive. God is living. You know, the first principle, the first thing that we say we believe, we believe in God, the living spirit almighty. The living spirit almighty. This is what we say we believe. And there's this portion of this that we acknowledge that it is us, we are it. There is no separation between God and us. So if it is the living spirit almighty, then what are we? We also have to be this living spirit almighty. Therefore, all of the things that you just named have to apply to each and every one of us. Reproducing. What are we reproducing? Ideas, concepts, groups that are changing the world. We are reproducing. We are breathing and being breathed. What else did we say? Creative, Creative and moving. We are moving. We are not meant to be stagnant or stay still. We are not meant to be bored. We're, you know, it's funny, many, many, many years ago, check this out. Many, many, many years ago during my regular fundamental Christian days, I used to be bored a lot. Now, a couple of my teachers said it was because I was a nerd and it was because, you know, you have this mind that's always active and you like to do stuff and... And my father just said, plain and simply, you just don't know how to sit still, right? <laughs> so, now, my father spent 20, I don't know, I usually get this number wrong, 28 and a half years in jail. It was a life sentence, but he got let go a little bit early for good behavior. Like, early? 28 years? But, <laughs> and I used to ask him often, like, Dad, how did you, one, maintain your sanity? How did you, you know... How did you do this 28 years in a room where you could touch, touch? Like, that's the space. And one of the things he used to tell me he would do was he would literally count every brick on all four walls, and then the floor, and then the ceiling. And what I realized was that was a form of meditation. Interesting. So I started to research meditation. Now, I don't remember. I think I may have been 15-ish. So I go research meditation, and I'm, you know, I'm doing martial arts, so I sort of had a vague idea of what it was. But I research meditation, and I say, I'm going to try this. <sighs> I'm, okay, I'm meditating. <laughs> and somewhere in there, like I slipped into this vision thing, where I'm now in heaven, and God is giving me a tour. And then God says, come in, I want to take you and I want to show you something. And we go into this boardroom, and he starts this PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and there's this pie chart, and it shows this is how much time you've spent <coughs> eating, how much time you've spent sleeping, how much time you've spent drawing and painting. And see this large portion? That's how much time you've spent saying you were bored. Um. And it was huge. I'm like, I've been bored or said I've been bored more than I've eaten. Or slept and then God said you know if I was the offending kind of being I'd be offended that I've given you come here with me and God took me throughout the entire planet and showed me all the types of fish every single one all the types of plants trees grass 
fruits, vegetables, all of its books that are written, all of the paintings, museums, galleries, musical instruments, types of music, everything, and said, how can you be bored when I've given you so much wonder that if you ate one fruit every day, it would take you several months to get back to the first type of, like, <gasps> then I woke up and I said, never again, never again am I going to ever choose to be bored because it's a choice. As metaphysicians, we are always at choice point. Do I stand and represent life and affirmingness and growth and movement and creation and reproduction and magnificence? Or do I settle into complacency, stagnation, blah, blah, whatever that is? Do I settle into it? Because there's this very interesting energy that we are, that we are encapsulated in. Right? Not only are we in the body of God, but the spirit is moving in through and as us. And we, we say we know this, right? But there's a difference between knowing something and knowing something. So you can know that you, I know I love my children. And I know that they love me. But once again, can I prove that? No, I can't but I know it for myself. I know that I love red velvet cake. I know I love it. You may not. Lisa may say, what? No, my, no, see, right? My thing is German chocolate, right? So we all have this element of knowing certain things, but this metaphysical thing of knowing, there's knowing the truth. And if we're going to say, I mean, that's one of the things that Lisa mentioned in the, in the the spiritual practice is knowing the truth. And if we know a truth, we have to live by that truth. Now, challenging thing is, how do we do so? Because there's, I run into a lot of people who we, we recite the things and we say the treatments and we do the whatever spiritual practices and we do the meditations. But then when this sacred sanctuary stuff is done and we go out there, we go back very easily into our human selves. But why? Why is it so easy to take off our cloak of divinity and put on the cloak of humanity, only humanity, as if they're separate, and go out into the world? Now, so I get Lion's Roar magazine, which is a Buddhist wisdom magazine, and I read everything, I see everything, movies, television shows, it's like I, I can't even turn it off now. I see everything as a metaphysician. I see everything through the eyes of metaphysics and religious science. And one of the things in this magazine this month is one simple practice that changes everything. Right? That's one of the key articles in there. And the practice that they are referring to is intention. Living by and setting one's intention. Do we live and move and have our beingness as beings that have set our intention to be divine, to be magnificent, to be love in action? Because we usually set our intention to, you know, I just, look, I just want to get to work. <laughs> My intention today is get to work and get, get through whatever it is I have to do. And that's fine on a level. But our ultimate goal is to be so high in our intention setting, our intention living, that everything we do now becomes spiritual practice. That there is no separation between treatment as what I speak or as what I write and living my prayer, living my treatment. There's a song that I heard many years ago when I used to go to Unity, our thoughts are prayers and we are always praying always praying. So whatever thought is crossing my mind, especially those thoughts that I choose to hold on to, I'm giving this far more energy 
then I may want to, especially when I am now holding on to it to the degree that I am now causing it to turn into material form. And then, oh, wait a minute, I, don't, I didn't want this. Then why did we manifest it? So being very clear of intention, being very clear of who and what we are as the living spirit is extremely important. Now, Emma Curtis Hopkins, in this book, Unveiling Your Hidden Power, says, now, I could, well, how, 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 oh, I wish I could have had this, this, this passage when, when I was a regular Christian. So, <laughs> whew, let us breathe. So, no, no, seriously, you, you'll get it when I read it, all right? <clears throat> so, we are clothed and fed and housed and healed. We have our blessings by our understanding. So the fifth affirmation is the same as saying, I am governed by my own understanding of God. Because we understand God, we love God and allow ourselves to be governed by the good that God is. And as we do so, we see that there can be no sin, no sickness or death in the good that we are knowing. Therefore, we affirm, I am governed by God the good, and so cannot sin, nor can I fear sin, sickness, or death. Not only can I not sin, I can't die. Because this fleshly thing is not who and what we are. And if God, the living spirit, is all there is, then that element of us that is it, which cannot die, there is nothing to fear about it or in relation to it. That's deep. But do we wake up in the morning and move about our day from this realization that I am not one, I am not my name. If I go to the courthouse tomorrow, bright and early Monday morning, papers in hand and say, yes, I'd like to change my name. I would like to now be called Sherry Khadijah <laughs> Jupiter Anderson. They will say that's what you want. Rainica. They will say that, okay, that's what you want to call yourself. Yes. And I will pay the fees, and they will say, okay. So clearly, I am not my name, because I can change my name. I am truthfully not my gender, because to a certain degree, my physical gender can be changed if I chose to. I can change my mind. There are a lot of things that I am not, but we identify with. But the one thing that we cannot change, you cannot change your divinity. You cannot change how magnificent you are. We can deny it. We can choose not to. That's why all these things are always talking about to the degree that we acknowledge, the degree that we become aware. We believe that heaven is within and we acknowledge it and we feel it and we believe it and we experience it to the degree that we become conscious of it. And conscious, if someone is unconscious, <laughs> they're not aware and one of the things you said about being alive was being aware to the degree that we are conscious to the degree that we are aware to the degree that we are awake and actively participating in heaven heaven in my mind heaven in my heart heaven in my words because if I'm thinking it and I'm feeling it and I'm speaking it, how could I therefore not see it? If everything, anybody in here, you remember the movie The Secret or the book The Secret? Mm -hmm. There's a part in there where someone, and I may be mixing up the car, but someone in there said something about, you know, they wanted a red car, and the moment they made up their mind to get this red car, they saw them everywhere. They hadn't seen them before, but once they made up their mind, they saw them everywhere. Once we make up our mind to see God everywhere, we see God everywhere. The other day I posted something on my Facebook page 
a young man who does a form of break dancing, who studied ballet and he combined the two. And he made a comment and said, as performing artists, as an artist, whether it's visual art, spoken art, sung music, as an artist, and I mean a, an artist artist, everywhere you look, everything you hear, everything you see now becomes art. Mm -hmm. To the degree that we will go to a gallery and we'll say, it's a fire hydrant, but I've never seen it like that. Mm -hmm. Because the person that chose to said, you've never seen it the way I see it. So let me take a photo of it and show it to you in a way that you will, <gasps> it's a fire hydrant and yet somehow it's beautiful. It's a functional tool firemen use, but I now am able to see it as art. When we are awake to our own lives, and our lives are the lives of God, we cannot help but to then become co-creators, acknowledgers of the God in and as everything else. You know, it's funny that going back once again in my former Christian days, I was always feeling that something was missing. But I knew there was there had to be more. There had to be something. Something is like when you're. I don't. I, I don't know if it's pepper. I don't know if it's salt. But it's missing something. I just. It was missing something, and then later I realized, I know what it's missing. It's missing something that I was unable to join in because it's a theoretical thing. This thing that we do, which is why it's very difficult for many is a practical, hands-on thing. It's a practical, hands-on. You can't theoretically take a recipe and theoretically cook it. You can't take a book on auto mechanics and theoretically read the book, but never touch the car. At some point, you have to make it part of our living, moving, and beingness, right? So, I remember and you've probably heard this phrase before. I am not my brother's keeper. Anybody ever heard that before? Know where it's from? I won't test you on it. So there, there are these two guys back in this place. Uh, their parents are called Adam and Eve. And these two brothers sort of don't get along. And one vanishes. Just not sure if he caught a plane or whatnot, but one disappears. And so God calls to the other one and says, hey, hey, where's your brother? And he says, am I my brother's keeper? Like, why are you asking me? Why are you asking me where he went? <sighs> when I first heard that, something went through my mind. Like, what, 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 what? I, do, I don't, it's, it, there's something deeper to this. There's something missing. And at the time that I was marinating on this, I was a student at Carlo College, which is a Catholic women's college, <laughs> which I'm neither. <laughs> so that's very interesting. And being a Catholic school, there are tons of nuns. Now, I had a nun for algebra, I had a nun for research paper, and I had a nun for intro to the Old Testament and New Testament. So I, I, knew, I knew some of the sisters, right? So I was asking this one sister one time, so sister, what, what does this passage mean to you? And she said something that could, I blame her, or I thank her, for starting me on this path of questioning, I mean really questioning, my spirituality. Ultimately what she said was, you are your brother's keeper and your sister's keeper. That's basically what she said. Now I understand that to mean not only Am I my brother and my sister's keeper? I am my brother and my sister. I am you. You are me. That's why some people are wearing these pens. Because what it's saying is, if you don't feel safe, find me. Come to me. If you don't feel honored, respected, I will respect you and I will honor you. I will listen to you. I may not be the one who can help you get through, but I will do my damnedest 
to do what I need to do for you. Because what I know is what I do for you, I'm doing for myself. And what I am doing for you, ultimately, I am doing for God. Why does it say in Matthew 25 something, 25, 35 something, so look, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was cold and you gave me warmth. Like, why is that? And then, and then the people said, but, but Master, Jesus, when did we do this for you? And he said, you did it for me when you did it for that person and for that person and for yourself. When you have done it for the least of these, you have done it for me. Meaning, when we do for each other, we are serving God. So ultimately, this concept of what is, it my, what is mine to do? Serve. Now, how I do that? Thousands and thousands. I mean, there's no way to... There's a myriad of ways. But I have to be willing to step in and say, I'm alive. Not just existing. Not just being. Breathing, but being breathed. And if I am here as this light, then I have to let my light shine. Now, Tracy's always fussing with me, like every time we hear the song, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let, like, and I stop saying this little light. That's just me personally. I stop saying this little light. Because I'm not, the, it's not little. It, I mean, it really isn't. Now, there's the part of, I may not know how great, grand, bright it is, especially when I'm first introduced to the magnificence of, oh, you are amazingly beautiful. And when you first hear that, it's like, oh, wow, he said I was beautiful. So it's like this tiny little spark that says, I want to believe it, but I'm not sure. Like most of us, the first time someone said, you are the I am, you are God, you are divine. You are divinity in human form. There's a part of us that was like, I, I want to I believe that. I really want to believe that. And there's a part of us that does, but our conscious mind fights it and says, how dare you think you are that great, that grand, that beautiful? Bring it down. How dare you think you are that talented, that skilled? Bring it down. This past Sunday, I was at Unity, New York, and did a workshop afterwards, and one of the things that came up in the workshop was this idea of confidence versus bragging. Each and every one of us should have this confidence that knows and knows that we know. Mm -hmm. I know that I am God in human form. I know that I am awake to the degree that I am supposed to be awake right now. I am creative to the degree that I am able to be creative consciously right here right now and I know that that can change it can upgrade it will never degrade I can only move forward because once we start on that I mean, we can take a three step back if we want to but you can't anybody in here ever had chocolate cake <laughs> so you know what chocolate cake tastes like can you unknow if you never eat chocolate cake ever again can you unknow no. Can you unknow what it's like to have children if you know? There may be elements of forgetfulness, but there's always a part of us that knows the truth. But we have to be willing. We have to let this little light say, I'm not really little. Right now, I'm little only because you're squinting your eyes. But if you open them to the full degree that they can open, you will see that this light isn't just, but it's a raging bonfire. It is literally the isness and allness of everything. Therefore, when you see the fire hydrant, you will see the, the aura, the light, the, the magnificence, the halo of God on a fire hydrant. You will see the aura, the, the illumination of God in that sparrow that flies to that tree or that squirrel. You will see it in everything. And everyone, 
even when there are people we don't want to see it. Because there are people that we don't... Namaste. I don't want to say we, there, there are people. And that's okay. At the level that we are, it is okay. Because if we don't acknowledge it, if we don't acknowledge that there is something there, whether it is illness, fear, if we spiritually bypass it, we are ultimately doing more harm to our own psyche, our own soul, our own spirit, in terms of our, because we really can't hurt it, but in terms of our conscious acknowledgement of it, because now we are denying it. Feel it. I really don't like you. But it's not really about you. On some level, it has to be about me. Because you can do what you do. You can be as mean, as disrespectful, as you get that. That's your prerogative. I don't have to let it affect me. I can choose to say, for example, suppose... Suppose someone comes up to you and they say, you know you're an amazing person. What do we, what do we immediately feel? I mean, we may feel shy, we may feel, oh, well, thank you. I mean, you may feel something, right? But uh, there's some level of us that wants to receive it. But if somebody comes up and says, Rose, you know, I, I've traveled the world or whatnot, and I've seen a lot of flamingos. And you are probably the tallest flamingo that I've ever seen. <laughs> like someone says that, and you're not going to be like, oh, oh raise it. I was, you're going to say, is Ray okay? <laughs> like, Lisa, do we need to pray about him? Because he thinks I'm a flamingo. Like, there's nothing in us that receives that. Because we know it's not true. But if someone says, we're stupid. Oh, did that resonate? That person that I don't like, that person that pushes my buttons, that person that makes me want to, ah! <laughs> it's not about them. They're giving me the opportunity to turn my gaze this way and say, what is in me that allows that person to stir this response and be grateful for it? Because that's also part of being alive. Being living means we are going to go through these peaks and valleys, these frequencies. And the frequencies aren't bad. Our heart goes through a boop, boop, boop. We don't want that boop, boop to not go through those because then it's an irregular heartbeat. Waves, light, all of this energy moves in this way, sound, so this, whatever this is, is great, is natural, and is fine. But I have to be willing to set my intention, to live from that place of knowing there is one spirit, one living spirit, one living spirit almighty that is everything, that is a circle That is all that is. And how great and good that is. And if it is great and good and magnificent and allness, then it is me. And if it is me, then I'm good. And if I'm good, then all of the things that I say about myself, because think about this, we talk to other people, right? We have conversations with people, but who do we talk to far more than any husband, wife, lover, child? We talk to ourselves far more than anybody else. And if the words we are saying to ourselves is, oh, you're so stupid. Oh, why can't you ever do anything right? You're so clumsy. Well, why am I so clumsy? If that's what we are saying to ourselves, then what we are doing is dismissing the truth of God. Dismissing the truth of who and what we are. Dismissing all of our magnificence. Rather than saying, yes, I am a human in human form. I am spirit in human form. Yes, I have the cloak of humanity. 
but I know that this is not all that I am. I know that I am light, I am love, encased in this human spacesuit. And I know that if that's what I am, then I am here to do great things, because how could I not be? How could I not be here? How could each and every one of us not be here to do what is ours to do? If you are here to be a street sweeper, then sweep streets the way Michelangelo painted. If you are here to teach, then teach in the ways that it's going to illuminate and enlighten as many people as possible. Whatever we are here to do, because everything we do is now our spiritual practice. When we fix food for family and friends, we're imbuing love into the food. When we buy coats or everything we do becomes a spiritual practice because that's what we are. Let's treat. Simply allowing ourselves in this moment to be breathed, knowing that as the breath comes in and as the breath goes out, there is a moment between the inhalation and exhalation where there is stillness. And in that stillness there is infinity, there is eternity. As our heart beats, there is a moment of pause where there is forever. The eternality that is God, because God is all there is. So what I know as truth in this moment right here and right now is God is showing up as me in human form. And knowing this to be the truth for myself, I know it is true for each and every person in this room. God is all there is. And if God is all there is, then knowing that the traits, the characteristics, the qualities of God also must be all there is. In truth, there is light, only light, love and only love, magnificence, beauty, joy, abundance, prosperity. Those are the cornerstones upon which I live my life because I know that they are truth. I know that when I see something to the contrary, 